Welcome to Gardening in the City. My name is Cynthia Holloway and I'm the City Horticulturalist. I'm here today with Kane Adams, our Landscape Specialist, and Josh Smith, the General Manager of South Branch Nursery. We're here today to look at a few plants that you may not be familiar with, some new introductions, and where better to look at than your local nurseries. Josh, let's take a look at this new Calamines speciosa. Um, I think this is what we used to call an old-fashioned or heirloom plant, but why don't you tell us about some of its new characteristics? Okay, this is a newer variety of quince. It's actually uh, from a series of quince that have double flowers, which are a lot bigger flower, um, multi-layered. Uh, this specific variety matures about three to four feet tall, which is different than the traditional quince, which can reach six to eight feet tall. Mm -hmm. Um, it's thornless, which also makes it different than the native quince or the most commonly used quince. It, uh, it's deer resistant, which makes it an interest to us here in Murfreesboro in Middle Tennessee. We have a big Very problem nice. with deer eating our plants and everything. It's a really tough drought tolerant plant that requires full sun. How about for massing? Um, is this a good plant for massing? It's a great plant to do mass plantings with. Okay. It, it, blooms before the foliage comes out on the plant, Excellent. so you get this mass of flowers and then the foliage starts to push out right behind that. So it can be used in a mass, it could be used in a mixed border. There are a lot of different uses for this plant. And I also understand that it's a great cut flower for people who like to do arranging. It is. It makes a beautiful cut flower. The multi-layered flower, the variety of colors that it comes in makes it a great flower for cut flowers. So what colors does this plant come in? Uh, right now, we stock the pink, the orange, and uh, I believe there's a red as well. Mm. The pink and orange are the most popular right now. I can see why. Okay, thanks. Let's look at this new Camellia sasanqua. This is a plant that um, I'm not all that familiar with because traditionally the camellias um, have not done that well in this zone. So let's talk about this new variety. Well, the newer varieties of camellia have, they've developed some varieties that have become more cold hardy mm -hmm. and are suitable for our area. Uh, the camellias, they're a great shrub. They, they're evergreen. They have a beautiful multi-layered flower. They flower from fall to spring, uh, which is normally a time when you don't have many things flowering. Uh, this plant does require afternoon shade, really good drainage, and with those in mind, it will do well in our area. How tall and how broad would this get? Most of these upright varieties get around six to eight feet tall. Some varieties will reach 12 feet, but that's going to be a long time in our area. So how far north can these be used? We are in Middle Tennessee to the north part of Tennessee, we're typically as far north as you can go with these. Okay. Uh, any special um, soil requirements or acid requirements, you know, because again, one of the things that's held us back from using these is, you know, they tend to want more acid, but have they, uh, do you still have to, to kind of baby them with that kind of regime? Yes, they're still an acid loving plant. There is some soil preparation that needs to be done if you're gonna plant this, especially in Middle Tennessee, the way the soil is here. We recommend digging the hole out really large, mm -hmm. using soil conditioner or some type of amendment that is very acidic, okay. that has some pine chips or pine matter in it. Okay. And when I say good drainage, that means you want, when it rains, you want the water to pass the root system and not stand around the root system. That's one thing this plant does not like. Okay, but what an absolute treat in the landscape because again, we're always looking for something evergreen and then something that blooms that time of year is just uh, what a plus for us. That's what makes it so popular for us, I believe. Okay, great, thank you. Josh, you've brought with us today probably one of my favorite plants. Let's talk about this. This one's called the Ito peony or intersectional peony for those out there. Um, and it's a cross between the tree peony and the herbaceous peony. So give me a little bit of history about this one, if you will, because um, 
it's just absolutely a gorgeous plant and I actually have one of these so I'm anxious to see it bloom for the first time this year. Like you said it's a great plant the the flowers are huge it was developed over a hundred years ago this variety this cross between the herbaceous and tree peonies and it was developed and then somewhat lost in the mm -hmm. shuffle of things and in the recent years they have more or less figured out how to develop this variety again. The cross makes this plant able to hold these large flower blooms up on the stalks as opposed to like you know the, the mm -hmm. herbaceous peonies. Typically you would stake yeah, those to hold the flowers right. up. The flowers are multi-layered on these. They come in a variety of colors. It's a beautiful plant when it's flushing out of the ground in spring and then followed up by the great flowers. That It makes it a great plant. The one I have is yellow, and I think the original cross uh, by Mr. Ito was between a yellow and white. So, of course, it was really the first yellow herbaceous peony, and like you said, it kind of got lost. I do believe he passed away before he ever saw one bloom, and then um, I think his family just kept going with it and then came and um, got with the breeder here in America. But um, they're wonderful cuts, I hear, mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of peonies are, but some aren't. Um, but I'm just so excited. I, what I've noticed about it is it absolutely has the root system, uh, more like a tree peony, mm -hmm. um, but it dies down to the ground every winter. And it's just going to be, I think, an exceptional plant. Um, how big do these get? These are gonna get around three feet tall and two to three feet wide right, in so. full maturity. Well, I'm very anxious to see them in bloom. Um, I think mine is a yellow and orange variety. And, you know, when they first came on the market, they were just unbelievably expensive, they weren't they? They were very expensive, yes. Uh, I remember actually seeing them in a retail setting for over $500 yes. for one this size. Yes, um, and of course that's come way down it has, definitely. with supply and demand. So, but that's a beautiful plant, thank you. Thank you. Josh, you've brought uh, for us to look at again some interesting um, perennials. And uh, we're going to lo be looking at the Nephophora, uh, better known as the hot poker plant. Uh, I'm familiar with the red variety, but I think that you've brought us some new varieties to talk about. So tell me about all these new ones. There are several new varieties. Uh, this is also known as torch flower red hot poker. There's several names. It's, it's been in our area for a while, the red one, like you said. Mm -hmm. There are now some newer varieties that are bright orange, bright yellow. There's pineapple popsicle, mango popsicle, papaya popsicle. These are all different varieties and different colors of the same plant. The biggest thing I like about this plant, I guess the characteristic that I like the most, is that it's really drought tolerant. Mm -hmm. It does really well in our area with poor soils, little water, it establishes really fast, but it also has a really long bloom season. Mm -hmm. So it blooms profusely from the hot part of summer, which is usually mid-May, until the end of summer, around the end of August. Well, that's pretty incredible. Um, I've even heard where if we get an early snow that they can either, in some places can even, they can tolerate, maybe not that cold, but they're blooming so long that they may catch themselves under some snow. That um, is true. What kind of um, beneficials are attracted to these plants? The, the way the flower is shaped, it attracts hummingbirds, of course, it has somewhat of a trumpet shaped flower. Mm -hmm. It also attracts butterflies. Deer typically don't like to eat this plant for one reason or another, uh, but for hummingbirds and butterflies as an attractant, it's a great plant. How tall do these get? All these varieties are gonna get between 12 and 20 inches tall with the flower spikes. So they're, are they a little shorter than the, the old fashioned? Somewhat shorter. Okay. The, the old fashioned you would get somewhat taller with the flower spikes. Right. Well, I'm really excited about these and, and I uh, can't wait to try them. Thank you. Thank you. Josh, let's talk about the Veronica you've brought with us today. Um, Veronica is a you know typical, I wouldn't call it an old fashioned plant, but it's been around for a long time. So let's talk about this new variety and what makes it so different. 
Okay, this is a different variety of Veronica. The one we're most commonly associated with is a blue flower. Mm -hmm. This one has a pink to red flower. It's uh, more or less a ground cover perennial. It gets about 10 to 12 inches tall and it'll spread about 12 to 15 inches in a clump. Oh goodness. It is a really drought tolerant, tough perennial. Once you get it established, it doesn't require much watering. It blooms very, very profusely from the middle of May until the end of summer. Wow. It makes it a, a real, put on a really good show. And what's its name? Red Fox. The it's red. a Veronica spicata. So the spicata refers to the shape of the flower, which is spiky. Spike. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very familiar with the blue one, and you're right, it gets quite a bit taller, and, and I haven't ever seen this one, um, and I guess as ground cover, like I said, goes, we, we're always looking for something to fill in and fill in fast, so it sounds like that might do the trick. Um, what about its beneficials do, and its requirements? Does it, is it heat tolerant, full sun? It's, it's full sun, very heat tolerant. Mm -hmm. The soil conditions, it, it tolerates poor soil fairly well. Okay. Butterflies like to hit on it because it does have the flower. Mm -hmm. And as the flowers die, butterflies really like to hit on those dead <laughs> flower blooms. Right. But the, uh, I think the pink spiky flowers and the fact that it blooms for so long in the summertime make it a plant of interest. Yeah, it's probably good for the honeybees. And you know, um, we're always looking for things for the honeybees these Absolutely. days to keep them going. All right, thank you, Josh. Thank you. Typically, when we see mulch piled up against the trunk of a tree, we call that a mulch volcano. Uh, the reasons why you want to stay away from that is because as you trap that moisture, you have a, a, a greater chance of a bacterial or fungal infection and also provide shelter for insects. What we have here is a tree that has had too much mulch applied around the, around the trunk of it. Uh, as you can see, I can pull this mulch back, continue to pull it back, and it's gonna expose, expose a lot more of this tree trunk than what should be mulched around. It's trapped a lot of moisture around this, uh, and that's something that you don't wanna do. You don't wanna keep moisture around the trunk of your tree. So when it gets like this, just go ahead and pull your mulch back. Uh, it's okay to have it a little bit deeper away from the tree, but as you get down to this tree, what you wanna do is you kinda wanna just come in and smooth it out to where it's, where it's down here, right below, or right at the root flange. Like I said, you can have your mulch a little deeper out here, but we wanna to try to keep it as thin as we can right here against the trunk. Please be sure to properly mulch your newly installed trees and shrubs. They will help them get established and protect your investment for the long term. We're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about some new tree and shrub introductions in the past few years. Josh, you know, we're seeing a lot of the new trends are gonna be smaller lot sizes, a lot of emphasis in the growing market of uh, outdoor living spaces. You know, we're seeing a lot of challenges in that area because some of the traditional plants we've used in the past just don't work well. Um, we're, we're really having to look for alternatives and there's been a lot new new introductions come out that can kind of take place of these uh, plants that we've used so much in the past. That's true. There are a lot of shrubs and trees that will take the place of the more traditionally used plants that do not get as large and will fit a smaller lot size like we're accustomed to these days. Well, one we've uh, had brought up here to the table is this uh, Kaleidoscope Abelia, which is an Abelia grandiflora. Uh, it kind of breaks the mold of the older Abelias you're used to. It's, it's, it's a lot smaller and compact. So, so give me some of the, uh, you know, where does this tr shrub need to be planted? This shrub could take the place of, say, a Firepower Nandina, a Crimson Pygmy Barberry. It's going to be a plant that's going to get about three feet tall and about three and a half feet wide in full maturity, which makes it really different than the abelia that we're accustomed to. This plant is a great plant. It offers three seasons of interest. Uh, in the spring, you get this great flush of foliage, which is shades of yellow, green, pink, red. As you go into summer, it hardens off, the foliage does. You get white flowers uh, for most of the summer. Going into fall, you get a great fall color with this plant. So you have three seasons of interest, which really make it a, a winner of a plant in my book. What color uh, fall colors do you generally see on this type? Shades of red to pink to purple. Oh wow, okay. Right now, it's got a lot of different colors in it. It's got the really nice red twigs on it. Do, do those, does it hold that red twig color into the winter also? No, those twigs will harden off to, to the woody color like you see under here. 
uh, which is a grayish color. This new flush has the red stem on it. Well, that's very attractive, and I think it's a really going to be a really good plant in the long run. I agree. Well, Josh, this has got to be one of my favorite Japanese maples. It's a Acer palmatum fire glow. Uh, very similar to a blood good, but a little bit smaller. So can, can you tell me about the characteristics of this tree? I can. Uh, this tree, where a blood good would reach maybe 20, 25 feet tall, this tree is going to max out around 14 to 15 feet tall. Oh, right. So it's going to fit that smaller lot size a whole lot better. It won't overgrow a small area. The characteristics of this tree that make it really interesting, you can't tell from looking at it right now, we've had it in a greenhouse due to the harsh winter we had. Understood. Uh, so in that greenhouse, it shades it somewhat, which makes the leaf somewhat bleached out. But fire glow is more known for a really vibrant red leaf, and it holds that vibrant color throughout the summer going into fall. Whereas a blood good is gonna, gonna discolor a little a, bit. A correct? lot of, yeah, a lot of the time, the, the blood good and other varieties are gonna wash out somewhat or they're gonna harden off to a green color. Mm -hmm. This one's gonna hold that really vibrant red all summer long in the fall. Well, what kind of fall color are we looking at on these? Fall color on these, you're looking at red to orange. Um, really good fall color. And then, in my opinion, it's a plant that is interesting in all seasons because even after fall, when it drops those bright leaves, you have this really nice stem growth in here that's a dark red and, and gray, and, and it has some different textures on it, and it makes a great plant for winter interest as well. So it's a four season plant then? In my opinion, it is. Good yeah. deal. Uh, so w where would we plant this most likely? This plant can go in the full sun. Okay. Uh, it's, it's great in the backyard, maybe right by a patio, or planted, you could use it in, in many different, different areas. You could use it in a bigger yard also, but it also gives you an opportunity to use it in a, in a limited lot section. Too. Exactly. Okay, good deal, man. That's a great tree. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Josh, continue with our theme of uh, replacement plants for the larger old traditional style. Uh, here we've got a, uh, what's called an Ilex oak leaf. And uh, it doesn't quite have the growth pattern of, of a Nelly R, correct? That is correct. Uh, what, what type of growth habit do you normally see out of this tree? This tree is gonna max out around 14 or 15 feet tall and about eight feet wide, where your Nelly Stevens and your other tree formed hollies can reach 20 to 25 feet tall and wide, which will fill up a small space really quickly. It can also become a real problem for maintenance. You can tr be trimming those constantly throughout the growing season to keep them that smaller size. This plant maxing out at 14 feet tall requires very little maintenance to keep it that size. Good deal. Uh, now, does this tree still have the berries that you're accustomed to with the Nellie R. Stevens and things? Um, yeah, it, it still gets a berry. It's a self-pollinating holly, so you don't need a male or female. It, it pollinates itself and, and holds the berries. Good deal. Now, the, the, these berries are more in clusters, correct? Mm -hmm, that's correct. Okay. Uh, now, it's called a red holly, and why is it called a red holly? Well. The, the new flush on this plant, and most red hollies, is a real reddish or burgundy color, and it'll hold that color until it starts to harden off in the hot part of the summer. Good deal. Now, this is a hybrid it holly, is. which means it was... It was crossed okay. between two other hollies to make this variety that has favorable characteristics, and those characteristics are that it's smaller, it grows really full and dense, and it does have the berries, self-pollinating, and this tree is a very slow grower, and it, I mean, it's been around for a little while, but you don't see it very commonly available just because it's, it's still kind of new, and with it being a slow growth, it is a little bit more expensive. That's correct? true, that's true. This is a huge oak leaf holly. Uh, they, are, they are somewhat slow growing, and you don't find large ones on the market for that reason very often, but I think in coming years, we're going to find this holly to become very popular for us. Well, something uh, I think we need to understand too is anytime you have something that's low maintenance and slow grow, it takes a long time to get it to that size, so you are going to pay a little bit more for it, but you're not going to have the maintenance cost associated with it. That's true. Good deal. Thank you for watching this episode of Gardening in the City. Please stay tuned for our next episode.